Good evening. Good evening, everyone. Hi. Welcome again to uh, another installment of the Lectori series of the University of Tampa MFA. I look abroad and believe I know everyone in this room, so I won't introduce myself, but I am standing in tonight again for Erica Dawson, who is on the mend. Our guest tonight is the poet Keicha Capers. She's the author of three volumes from BOA Editions, Beautiful in the Mouth, which won the Al Poulin Prize at BOA. Al Poulin was a good critic and poet and uh, anthologist, did some very important things, one of our forebears, since we're thinking about that. Uh, the Keys to the Jail, it's her second book in 2014, and most recently, if she will hold it up, All the Charm, thank you, which I was supposed to have with me as a visual aid, but you've fulfilled that function. Thank you so much. It's just, just out. Her poems, essays, and uh, short stories have appeared in numerous places, very fine places. Best American Poetry, Narrative, American Poetry Review, Prairie Schooner, and on and on. She was a Wallace Stegner, Stegner Fellow at Stanford and a Catherine Bakeless Nason Fellow at Breadloaf. And she served as an emerging lecturer, writer lecturer at Gettysburg College. Currently, she's on the faculty of Hugo House in Seattle, which is somewhere near where she lives in that area. And she's a senior editor at Poetry Northwest, a great magazine that's been around for a long, long time and has been a, a pulse star, certainly in that region, as a great a magazine, I think started by David Wagner, or at least he was one of the people there, yeah, who's still around. Uh, she lives with her wife and daughter uh, on an island in the Salish Sea, which is around Seattle. And I mention this bit of information because all the charm emanates from her decision to become a single mother and her marriage to a woman she loved years before. Of all the charms, uh, Sarah Nance in the Los Angeles uh, Review of Books observes, Love of self and love of the earth are deeply imbricated uh, with one another, the poet says, all united by a careful attention to the realities of embodiment. It is in part this focus on embodiment that brings some of the most moving and striking poetry in this particular collection. In, considering, in consideration of what it means to raise one child while still desiring another child, Kuypers makes a stunning contribution to writing on motherhood. It's a large claim. Beth Ann Fenley adds, her vision is original and her voice precise, questioning, sensual, wry, is one I'd follow anywhere. And so I say, let's get with it and follow that voice. Welcome, Keisha Capers. At the small town drag show. Watching Daisy pukes take the dollar bill between her teeth, shake her fake tits in each boy's peach fuzz face. I recall my once praised body as it comes alive again. Long forgotten cat now raised from its shallow backyard grave. Cat with sweat on its fur. Cat that nightly screamed below the kitchen's glass. Cat whose backbend stretch of joy raised her pink pinhole to the sky. Daisy's high heel boots scuff the floorboards. Her nylon blend lashes flutter under fluorescence, and I feel a tingle somewhere. My knees, my tongue, as I pour my sex, its proud performance back into this dress I've worn like a shroud.
I'm really interested uh, these days in poems that take risks. I think I've always been interested in, in risky poems. Um, they feel really vital. Um, but my ideas about what is risky has changed a lot. I think it used to feel really risky um, just to be confessional, just to say something personal in my poems. Um, what feels more risky to me these days is being wrong, um, being liminal, being in between, um, not knowing where I stand and knowing that that in-betweenness is off in some way, um, being too old, being too young, um, trespass. Uh, I think those, those are some of the places that, that feel wrong to me that I'm interested in investigating. Um, before I read this next poem, I want to acknowledge um, that we're on, on the land of the Seminole tribe this evening, um, and we are grateful for this place that they are loaning to us. At the Arley powwow with my unborn child. Past the pup tents and teepees, just beyond Moe's Indian fry bread tacos, children are doing the snake dance. On the highway to Semi's Pass, each slung with half a house and deer leading their speckled young through dead grass give a shiver. Little swimmer of shallow waters, diver of lights out interior oceans, who am I to teach you how to dance? I buy earrings made from porcupine quills. Lemonade from the most expensive stand. The one where white boys from town crush thick huckleberries into the ice. And I'm embarrassed for myself again. I taught at Auburn University um, for four years. And uh, I really loved that time. Um, I had never lived in the South before, and I think I only had sort of uh, Hollywood ideas of what it would be like to live in Alabama, and, um, and it was such a surprising and extraordinary place to be. Um, and when I taught at Auburn University, I, I got to invite some wonderful poets down um, to read and to teach my students there. And one of those poets was Liz Bradfield. Do you guys know? Her work. Um, she uh, leads whale watching tours and is an ecologist um, and is also an incredible uh, queer writer. Um, and I brought her down to Auburn and she led a workshop on um, attention to objects. And we were each supposed to bring in one small object and study it very carefully during this workshop and then write a poem. And I'm really terrible at doing an exercise in the room when I'm told to do it. I make my students do that all the time, but I myself cannot stand it. Um, so I brought something with me. I can't remember what it was and, um, and tried to write a poem and it didn't work. But then later I took this exercise of um, intense scrutiny back home with me um, and wrote this poem. Still life with nursing bra. Fall open. Unfold me. Hook and eye undone with one hand. Fingers that know their way now in the dark. You contain me. Underwire, circling my breasts in half bangle, like the copper bracelets, lemniscating wrists of women who've never worn bras, never held back their multitudes. You of the hidden crabapple bruise yellowing on my chest, 
You of her ecstasy, eyes rolled back in her head, hands in her sweat damp hair. You, milk that rivers down my skin, shimmering of hunger, the want of a wet mouth. Nursing bra, black, nude, electric orange and lace trimmed, tucked in the back of a drawer or hung dangling from a doorknob. I once fumbled with you, stale of the dentist's lobby, cut by a thin mewling that made us all shiver. The waiting room's terrified ripple as I struggled with the clasp that kept me from spilling open. Instead, the leaking through, a sticky flower blooming down my chest until I wrenched you free, flapping and fearless, one wing taking flight from my breast. I started this book uh, when I was pregnant with my daughter, and um, and I finished it when she was about four years old. Um, and so a lot of these poems have a baby in them. Um, in, but I think it's wrong to say that this book is about being a mother or having a child um, or babies uh, or BBs, as my baby says. Um, my second book had my dog in it a lot, and it was not a book about a dog, right? The dog was the way of entering the poem. The dog was the muse. The dog was the way of writing about everything else. And in this book, the baby is the way of writing about everything else. Getting the baby to sleep. Sometimes the baby can't reconcile the self with the self. Too hungry to eat, too tired to sleep. I know the feeling. Oh, America, on those nights when you are too beautiful for me to forgive you any longer for allowing us to kill each other with your graceless bullets, or exile our neighbors across the fences of your fictitious border, or argue over the ownership of each young girl's body as if its freedom is a lie she must stop telling herself. Then, America, I go out into your radiant arms. The baby and I drive through your streets, over the bridge and its light-chipped waters, under a moon so big, so full of itself, that though I know it belongs to the world, it can't be anything but American. I hang my arm out the window and skim the air like touching skin. I breathe you in and the baby sleeps. So my wife and daughter and I, we live outside of Seattle um, on an island, Bainbridge Island, um, and we get to take the ferry into the city. Um, in the opening credits of Grey's Anatomy, if you've ever watched that show, they are like on a ferry for a couple seconds, and that is the ferry to Bainbridge Island. Um, very charming. And the island is especially charming in the fall when it turns into... Um, just a pumpkin, cinnamon, apple cider uh, extravaganza. Um, and we, we moved there a couple years ago, and the first fall um, that we lived there, we experienced uh, the Haunted Hayride, which the city puts together in a local park. And it's really not scary unless you're six years old, like my daughter Nella. And... Um, and the teenagers, the local teenagers, sort of come together and put it on. Um, but it was also, it was a difficult time. It's a really small community on Bainbridge, and it was a difficult time to join the community of parents. On the haunted hayride with Audrey, who, 
by the way, is dead. Who hanged herself in the neighbor's woods last week, just in time for Halloween. Whose lank green hair I know only from the missing signs posted on telephone poles, now rain logged and peeling in ragged strips of zombie bandages. Who should be here tonight, not as a ghost, but as a teenager? like these other ten, dressed in scarecrow rags, who blank-faced writhe to the latest pop hit, spooking my own small daughter. It's all right, I tell her, toe-head hidden in hay bales, just teenagers. Audrey, I don't have to be your mother to be furious with you. When a specter zip lines across the field, gown aglow with battery operated ectoplasm, my child lifts her eyes and gasps. They forgot the angel wings, mommy. So that I want to stand up and yell, Audrey, get down from there this minute. Stop scaring me half to death. Being a parent is so terrifying, which is something that I didn't um, realize I was signing up for. Um, I just flew down here today from Michigan, which um, is where a lot of my extended family lives, and we go there every summer to see cousins and aunts and uncles. And um, this morning I said goodbye to my daughter, and she headed off on a plane uh, to Montana with my parents, and I came down here. Um, it's always weird to put her on a plane with somebody else. This poem is called The Great Lakes. My wife, the one I thought I'd never have. Because does any of us believe we deserve to be happy in this life? Let's my daughter paint her toenails a sloppy silver as my aunt smokes a second cigarette and pages through photos on her phone so I can see how the car looked after my cousin wrecked it last month in a past midnight field near the poultry processing plant just a half mile from grandma's unsold house. High on meth or heroin or maybe not high at all, but fighting her hunger. While I pick through this dead girl's jewelry, just as starved for something to hold on to as those feckless gulls pecking the sand a few feet away. The sun is shining brighter than the gold-plated necklace I fasten around my neck and swear to wear forever. And even though scientists are finding nicotine in the water and oxy in the mussels, my cousin's kids are down there at the edge of the beach, screaming their heads off with the pure joy of plunging below the surface. It's hard not to feel good watching the waves. But my aunt needs me to believe in the glass and the blood. And her daughter's body a thing unidentifiable, a thing none of us had really seen in years. She needs me to understand that her pain is water as far as the eye can see. I have a great time teaching uh, at Hugo House uh, in Seattle. It's um, a really cool community of writers, um, but my classes are, well, they're super, they're probably a lot like a low-res program. There's a really interesting mix of folks. There are people who are just out of undergrad, um, who were creative writing majors as undergraduates. There are people who, um, used to write and now it's been years and they're coming back to something that they've always loved. Um, so people at all different stages of their lives and of their writing lives at the same time. Um, 
But that's a very different feeling from teaching in a traditional undergraduate classroom. And um, when I did that at Auburn, my students were always falling in love with each other. And I think there's something about teaching um, undergraduates um, in the intimate space of a creative writing workshop. They just want to fall in love. But maybe that happens to you guys, too. I don't know. Um, so I wrote this poem when I was a professor at Auburn, and I read it a couple times at different readings there, and each time uh, different students thought it was about them. <laughs> Teaching day, Obad. Do you guys know what an Obad is? Yes. Yeah. So it's a song um, in for the morning, but but more than that, um, traditionally when it's a poem, um, it's it's about two lovers parting and not wanting the dawn to come. Like, please let it stay dark. I don't want to hear the birds in the morning because uh, I don't want to have to part from you. Teaching day obad. This anxious spring, two of my students become lovers, and on Tuesday evenings. I walk home after class under the unimaginably tender buds of the still spare limbs that seem this star-flecked air. Across town, the new pair climb the staircase to his rooms, their hands another set of constellated branches hopelessly entwined. Light from the hallway stretches its thin neck across the bed her bare feet, he puts on some music. And when she goes for a glass of water and finds his plate in the sink, a gleaming pockmarked moon, she lifts one damp crumb on her fingertip and presses it like an old fashioned stamp to her tongue. The poems we read in class today run through them now like fish to sea their urgency, their flash. How are you guys doing? Two more poems? Does that sound about right? OK. All right. Um, I feel like, so this is my third book, and I feel like every time I put a book together, there are a couple poems that make it into the book at the end that I don't realize should really be for the next book. Um, and so this book, like I said, the baby is kind of the muse, but my wife snuck into this book too. And I think the next, the next book is really going to be the wife book, which I hope she's prepared for that. <laughs> but um, yeah. There's some wife, wife poems in here. We drive home from the lake, sand in our shoes. The dart of fish faint at our ankles, each shuttered barbecue shack a kudzu flash in my side mirror. Pleasure has become the itch of a mosquito bite between my shoulders, and your rough thumb on my thigh, a tickle gentle as turtles, bobbing in sea dew oil slick and cellophane scraps. How many years did I suffer the loves that gave too much freedom and not enough tenderness? Let me be like the man we saw outside of Nada Solga, hands cuffed behind his back, cigarette in his mouth, and you be the sheriff, leaning in close, cupping the sweet flame to my waiting face. All right, thank you guys so much. My daughter loves this poem. This is her favorite. This is her, it's her requested poem. She makes a cameo in so many of these, but this is the one that she really feels like she owns. Even though I'm sure she could not understand it. Told you so. When my daughter spills her orange juice, I wipe it off the linoleum with the old plaid boxers of the man I thought I'd marry. Elastic ripped out, seams unraveling, 
I've had lives already. At night, they crawl across my skin before I can turn on the light. We spend all these years wanting, and then one day, sudden as a lamp set to a timer, we have. There were the nights I drank just so I could feel a little more of my own unhappiness. Now, with my feet pressed into this rug, I'll never be that drunk again. Before I went to the clinic to get pregnant, I cried onto the shoulder of an old flame, worried that whoever I loved next would never know my body when it was beautiful. How could I have been wrong about so many things? Thank you. I think that that has changed a lot for me over the years. Um, I think that in the same way that my ideas about what is risky have changed, my ideas about um, what I need to be in conversation with and who I need to be in conversation with and who my poems need to be in conversation with has changed as well. Um, And and I think that, that when I thought risk was um, circumscribed by a confessional, a confessional aesthetic, um, personal confession. Um, I think I thought at that point that there needed to be, I don't know, not a, not a timelessness certainly, but, um, but I think I thought I needed to play down some of like pop culture references um, and anything that would uh, limit um, the poem in terms of how long it might last. Um, and I don't feel that way anymore at all. I feel like the topics and ideas that my work is called to and that it needs to be in conversation with um, are of this very moment. And so how could they not contain those things, those elements of our everyday. I think I'm still learning how to do that in a way that's not clumsy or self-conscious, um, but I think that's different from being concerned about, oh, I'm not allowed to do this or I shouldn't do this. Um, as I was saying, I, I'm interested in in, in risk that has to do with wrongness, being the wrong person in the wrong place at the wrong time, um, and how those things relate to um, the identity of the speakers in my poems. Um, I was on a plane today, and I haven't done this in so long, but I haven't been in the South in so long, and I lied to the woman next to me, and I called my wife my husband. I haven't done that in forever. Um, but I did that today because I couldn't disrupt her picture of the world in that moment. And I think in my poems, I want to do the exact opposite. I want to disrupt the picture of the world. And I want to disrupt my picture of the world. I want my reader to be uncomfortable, and I want to be uncomfortable. And I don't think that that can happen in in poems or fiction or nonfiction, unless um, all those elements that infiltrate our lives, um, Instagram and plastic water bottles floating on the beach, um, unless all those things make their way into the work.
Mm-hmm. I think that has changed a lot too. Um, I I used to really give myself a hard time if I wasn't writing. Um, you know, if if days went by, if weeks went by, if months went by, and I don't. I don't do that anymore. I don't worry about that anymore. Um, I know that what's happening is that I'm accumulating and storing things up and that then there's going to be this really fruitful period. And so during the fruitful period, I think I'm writing um, all the time. And uh, most often my poems start with a line and most often that line is an image um, but I think a lot of times I, when I'm not writing, I'm collecting. And so I'm collecting all these images and I'm collecting seasons and I'm collecting smells and I'm collecting textures. And then, um, but I'm not feeling like there's anything urgent that I need to say. And then when suddenly something urgent enters my life, then I have all these great things to make a collage out of, right? Um, there's a poem in my first book uh, called Diagnosis, and uh, that poem st- started when I was visiting New York after having not been there for a long time, and I was there in the winter, and I was just writing down. I had a, have a little notebook, of course, that I always carry with me, and I was writing down just all the images, just the, the nurses taking their cigarette breaks outside the hospital and, and the corner bodega roses and all these things and I was writing them down and I thought these are great like wow I'm really good at describing things Um, but I didn't have anything to say yet there wasn't any need for those images yet Um, and then it was months and months later uh, that I went to the doctor and I got an unexpected diagnosis and I thought all of a sudden I had something that I needed and wanted to say, and I had the images to say it with. Um, So I think I'm always, yeah, collecting and saving things up, and then I know when it's time to use them. Uh, Keicho will be, of course, uh, giving a talk tomorrow at 9 o'clock, so we'll see you all then. Tomorrow night we are off, and then we will resume uh, on the following night. Uh, We'll see you all in the morning.